Welcome back to Cloud Computing and Big Data. Today we have a short lecture 14, Online Social Networking and Graph Databases. So we dive now in topics which are basically very large in nature. The idea of graphs and using them for information processing is quite a interesting topic and it's very on vogue these days. So graph neural networks is a big hype, but also graph databases, which we will show a little bit in the short lecture here to basically make you aware that there are also other ways how you can store and process information than traditional SQL or NoSQL databases. And with this, we, get, we basically dive in a couple of lectures on that are rather short, just giving you more or less some overview and some pointers to more materials because largely <clears throat> we would be able to teach a whole course on graph databases and online social networking attached to it. So before we start with the material of the short lecture 40 today, let us look a little bit what we had the last time. The last time was in lecture 13 based on OpenStack and basically the information that this could be something you might call a cloud operating system. So what we mean by this is by really shifting the view if you compare all the lectures that we had before, where we use existing cloud solutions like in MS Asia, where we use existing cloud solutions like AWS services or even Google. Basically here you have the other view or perspective that basically use it in your office as expert in cloud computing and your boss will come in and says, I want my own cloud in the company. So here we're talking about more or less a private cloud that should be of course and also interoperable in one respect or another with the public cloud vendors. And instead of now doing software engineering and create lots of different components, which are then should be also scalable and inherent all the concepts that we learned in this course in terms of scalability, in terms of maybe also the availability of data, of computing, virtualization and so forth. Instead of doing all this and create your own components, OpenStack is so to speak a toolbox that gives you already lots of different components. And you see that a little bit here in the overall architecture um, and component set that OpenStack provides. So you have services on different levels that you can actually implement, but you don't have to implement all of them, right? So obviously <clears throat> you need always some form of virtual machines computing, but if you really implement all the different storage systems that we learned in the course, this object block storage or file storage, um, that is of course up to you and depends on your kind of cloud you want to deploy. But essentially you see the general blueprint for an application um, where you basically say that's what you want to do in the cloud, some sort of dashboard for the services based on compute network and storage services. So what you then pick out of these different, let's say services that you have available here and OpenStack provides actually quite many of those for very specific purposes. Um, that's definitely up to you. So you have to look what you actually need, what maybe also fits to the standard hardware you want to have in your company in order to make these basically hardware components then shared across your company and then of course secured in a certain way. They also there basically are different tools available that really help um, to secure your environment basically. And if you think about also orchestrating it with multi-user environments, as we know, with heat and other services, that's quite important. So <clears throat> we come to the point of really combining different lectures now um, where we have learned already, for instance, again, from the storage perspective that we have this different object block and file storages in AWS, if you remember, with the S3 and so forth. But now we're thinking about what could be very similar services like we have in AWS, but you put it in your own storage in your own cellar right, or on your premise, as we would say. So there, OpenStack is incredibly useful, has all of different components, also for the hardware lifecycle, and, you know, Keystone and other shared services here can then help also with the lifetime management of this cloud. And you see billing is even possible up to monitoring all of these different services. What do you really need in order to ensure that your cloud is still running? You have different um, APIs, you see here EC2 API, so obviously with APIs being interoperable to clouds that if needed, you can actually shift the kind of computing maybe even to a public cloud if needed. So, and this goes with different, let's say SDKs, 
with different APIs that you can actually use, even command line interfaces that are possible. Also based on containers, if you want, we learned containers also recently in the course. That's of course also a deployment model, which is quite popular and should be used. And of course, from the pure, let's say, um, perspective of how you now want to share the resources, you have also different options that we learned in the course. You can use the containers as I just was alluding to, but you can also just have your own premise resources, basically virtual, um, running them with virtual machines instead of containers or bare metal, or even a combination of those, which is of course now in very attractive way. Hence, this whole package provides significant value uh, con if you compare it with your own developments that you otherwise have to do. And especially many of those services are already, let's say, scalable by nature. So they have been implemented with this point of view and also are designed to be interoperable with each other. So this is good news. So <clears throat> basically, if your boss comes in, you have a good answer. You just have to analyze, of course, what you basically need within your own company. Now, one example application that we had um, that provides um, basically an auto scaling feature space of combining several of these services like virtual machines with Nova, which then basically is a server structure um, which you can use on top of your own hardware resources. And we learned that basically, of course, as a gaming industry evolves and more and more users are there, like in Blizzard, for the example, we basically have something where we need to create VMs or even delete VMs if they're not needed. So hence the game server should be scaling up and scaling down. And this should be, of course, in the best case, automatic, because otherwise you have always, let's say, administrators that 24-7 have to watch the load on all the different game servers and then basically see if they have to manually remove or manually add a VM to scale up or scale down with all the different load. In order to do this kind of um, life cycle management, we basically learn there are different services that you can use within the OpenStack environment, like for instance, a Zenlin service that then basically can uh, be, you know, um, in a way programmed to scale up your game server cluster. Um, you also have, of course, an auto scaling service that firstly have to check the load. And if the load is, let's say, large enough, where you say, um, for better load balancing, I create another game server. Then you basically use this auto-scaling feature with the Zenlin service that then does nothing else than automate the process, so to speak, to create a VM via the typical Nova infrastructure or Nova service, which then has this power of the VMs to create one and then have the game server basically there. And suddenly the load can be then basically put on three game servers here in the example. Obviously, we have the same sort of functionality for scaling down if we basically see that some of the loads are not anymore um, you know justifiable with the game server being almost not used um, or basically all of the three of them have still some capacity which might be feasible to put it just on two game servers without losing performance here you basically do the same thing um, you firstly check the load and then basically see a little bit the life cycle um, part in the sakar service in order to um, trigger really the, the idea of um, deleting a VM, which means, of course, there should be some, let's say, um, live migration happening to the other game servers before you really, you know, delete the server and then basically have uh, less consumption of services, which of course is very important. You see that a little bit um, shown here in the graph, um, which is basically a blizzard idea of how OpenStack is then used. Um, and particularly, you can imagine for this gaming company, this auto-scaling uh, behavior is quite important and they do it in many games. Here's a best-selling game, Overwatch, in that particular example. But of course, this online gamer with World of Warcraft and so on, this is an important part. Right, but let's go a little bit into the short lecture of today. <clears throat> As I was saying, we basically have um, learned almost everything which is quite important in this course. Um, and at the end of the course, we traditionally use really uh, go basically a little bit into related topics, which are often in a cloud environments or are basically very much driven by big data. But it would take a whole course, right, like graph databases, graph basics, and then maybe a bit graph neural networks. This would take a complete course. So we can here just give pointers. And the same is actually true with the big data streaming tools. Also, streaming is a very big topic and their applications. Also, there we just do a short lecture. So 
Hence, um, all of these theoretical aspects like social graph traversal, graph theory that basically is required, I keep here out of the course today, um, which usually is basically important to understand the whole situation better, why you basically have much better performance, more logarithmic performance scales and so forth. It's sometimes actually teached in computer science 101 courses um, with basically having a much better graph traversal performance and for instance just look up tables or let's say matrices that you have to work with but here we basically put the emphasis on a few couple of things where um, the cloud is very strong and where they're related then also to big data and one of them is of course Facebook uh, where we have some examples how to deal with big data in one of the earlier lectures we already learned that Facebook has tremendous data and it's incredibly complex to operate in a high performance so that if you like something that's actually directly visible to everyone. And we learn by this also a little bit the kind of idea why people at Facebook actually are doing this, because of course there's advertising, there's promoting, there's a return of investment. Because if you know, Facebook is essentially free, but of course you're basically exposed to lots of advertisement all the way. And we formalize this a bit with some, let's say, key functionalities and examples where we then make the case a little bit for the idea of why to use graph databases. When you think about online social networks, you can model them as graphs. And then, of course, if you want a friend of a friend and information about this, you basically perform a social graph traversal and we learn a little bit about it. As I said earlier, we cannot do the full course here, um, but at least we capture way how it's basically used in clouds. It's also good to understand architecture. So rarely you have essentially one big database today that fuels a complete cloud environment or cloud offering. So usually it's a smart combination of different architectures. One might be using the Spark GraphX library, another one an AWS service. So, and also the databases might be a combination of SQL, of NoSQL, and then also graph databases. So. Also, this lecture should say that everybody should directly move to graph databases much better in performance. If you have SQL database for some certain operations and you have a good index on them to basically search something specific, they can be beating also graph databases, of course. So in the end, the architectures we will look at a little bit will allude to the point that you have a smart combination of different approaches that cloud operators are doing. But here, of course, we focus today a little bit on the graph idea and the cloud usage. And in a way, the cloud offerings that we have today, like Google Ads and Google AdSense, uh, all of that is a little bit driven with influencers and marketing, advertising, promotions, where also lots of money is to be basically spent or basically oh, lots of money is also um, able to, you know, put in your own pocket if you do it right. So an interesting short lecture, I hope, which giving lots of pointers to different directions, and if you think about big data now and the idea of online social networks, um, we have here something which is a little bit, again, um, very, you know, inhomogeneous. So you don't have a typical table character in the social networks. The big data grows with people that really like Facebook. Others just create a profile, almost no data is there. Others have more company websites. So there are lots of heterogeneity here, and this goes to different areas. The volume at all that is, let's say, uploaded and made available. You can imagine how often people are use Facebook, for instance, or Google or even YouTube, if you want, to do basically um, the, the content creation. This has been different velocities. Sometimes the people use heavily these services, others not. If you compare it to the YouTube channel here in the course, you remember during the semester, there's, of course, uh, many velocity or high velocity in all the lectures that are uploaded. Once it comes to summer vacation, there's not much in terms of uploads. So different velocity for one channel, but also different users have different velocities. And then, um, needless to say, the variety in all the different formats. So people are rather uploading images in Instagram, while maybe perhaps in Facebook, it's a bit text and audio and video oriented. So there's all different ways of how all these different social networks here, just a couple of them like LinkedIn and so on, you know already. Twitter, of course, quite interesting because here you're limited to 300 characters or so and a couple of pictures. So all of these different, um, let's say, social networking sites have, of course, a very unique selling proposition usually and with also a bit different ideas how to structure this content. 
And this is for a big data center, of course, quite a challenge to support. And basically, as we will see, to keep that updated in real time. So, right, if you want to have the example here, which is another form of reality uh, that we see in Facebook, uh, driving velocity is really the like idea. Or in YouTube, you want to have people that like this directly seen and not wait for a couple of hours and, ah, someone liked actually this video from me or basically someone liked a Facebook post. So real time is a big essence, but also a big challenge, of course, if you think about big data, large data sets and updating this information all over the time. So what could be the volumes just roughly you see here in terms of the number of users, uh, which is here Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, very huge users. Um, these days, Instagram is very popular. Um, this is a little bit perhaps outdated from a couple of years ago, but still the message to take away is really that the social network sites, um, of course, have lots of lots of users. And with all of this, we have something that you could basically see looks like a mesh like this. And immediately you get the connection, right? Well, people doing a little bit here and a little bit there sharing. We have a very inhomogeneous structure of this and basically not a one to one all mapping of all these different nodes in this match. Hence, we quickly come to something we call the graph network of social media sites. And it doesn't matter if it's now Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube. In a way, you have this likes business and you have the, basically the connection or the subscribe business, if you know, on YouTube, which basically then makes this kind of connections between the different nodes. Now, when you model this, of course, you see it a little bit more as a concrete example now from this high level perspective to a low level perspective that you know, perhaps in Facebook, you see the friend of a friend is basically, of course, nothing else than connecting nodes with specific IDs. But then you can imagine that one is basically liking a specific comment of someone else um, that is perhaps in a type of check in. So basically at some specific location that then essentially tag some specific other user. And you see directly that how basically inhomogeneous this can be growing in all sorts of different direction. So check in at the Gatebridge here just as one example. So hence you basically see here Alice, Golden Gatebridge, Bob, these are all parts here where you think these are parts of the graph. And then of course what they do with this, if they like it, if they check in, um, if they comment on it, these are all questions now for basically creating new basically connections between the different nodes, which have been previously not there. In fact, you can also unlike if you know, basically then basically kill connection. So that's quite interesting. Now, when you think today of doing this connections with rather a big, let's say matrix or a typical relational database, you would be quickly having lots of lots of entries with having no information at all because the users uh, basically in the next, let's say, row, just have nothing else to do with you. And, and basically have just once maybe did a like on a comment and is actually not an active Facebook user, for example. So here, um, this is something where graph databases, for instance, are very useful. They concentrate of the real connections or relationships, if you want to uh, see it a little bit more accurate. And uh, of course, then also thinking about that in a way you want to have this typical analysis of this graph. That's where you basically then perform the social graph traversal, where you have specific social links. You want to understand the, the, you, the friend of a friend. And then this friend of a friend actually had another friend that you maybe know by checking in at the same location, um, basically at the Golden Gate Bridge or so. So, and by doing this, you move through the graph entities in order to find these information and to connect it or reconnect it to other users. And this is, of course, where then this graph databases have a very good API user, usually, or a very good performance to really go alongside the nodes in order to provide the social networks with uh, something like a usability that also is accepted by the users, that the likes are directly seen, and so forth. Behind is, of course, much more actions to follow, several other databases that carry the general database information, but then the, the kind of database and the graph is providing then the, the whole information in a very specific way in a high performant way. Hence, uh, if you formalize this a little bit, we have certain 
um, you know, terms which are usually used in this, like entities. This could be people, individuals, it could be companies, organizations, startups. Um, and then basically you can see that these, of course, are in some relationship with each other. This could be lots of different uh, aspects. It could be like or dislike relationships. It could be basically working at or checking in. So you have basically the best idea if you think a little bit about Facebook for those that know Facebook or for some of you that then are not on Facebook, you can think about YouTube. It's the same way if you subscribe, if you're not subscribe um, between these different entities. So this is how you model it as a big mesh, so to speak, or big graph really with nodes and then all the different interlinks. There basically, of course, um, then the the elements that change frequently so they are also have to think about that the change should be propagated perhaps and what happens if some as these nodes are suddenly disappearing let's say one organization is closed of course here also the graph has to be restructured or let's say cleaned up with the mess if basically one of the nodes is maybe disappearing which might be not so simple because you have already established many different links and they suddenly point all to something which is not existing anymore hence the graph Databases and this online social networks have already, of course, also certain challenges, especially if you think about up to date information. So coming back to Facebook, you can probably say it's the world's largest online social network these days, um, probably also shared with YouTube a little bit, maybe, which is also getting more and more popular. Some say Instagram is more popular. Um, basically here in the way it doesn't matter for this course, they have all similar ideas. We take the Facebook example um, that you basically can freely re register, which is, of course, interesting um, if you think about that there's no credit card swipe, as I told you, as many other software as a services are doing. But then, of course, you have here other ideas how basically these people are making money. And you see basically a little bit here um, the idea. So when you are in Facebook, um, you can basically build your business by adding different ads and you basically can then have, you know, basically an ad put into Facebook so that others that are basically on different specific regions, um, then basically will see that ad and you see here, you will pay for it. So basically you are the one that actually then uses this for advertising. And this could be quite accurate in terms of the audience. It's also the same mechanism in Google. So you can boil this down to different locations, even age categories and much more. So it's quite specific who is then looking on your ad and chances are that this is something, of course, of interest. If you know more about, want to know more about the story, it's also good to see essentially the social network movie here. I think it shows you some insights on how Facebook was developed, how it came to perspective. Of course, with this, we also directly add security concerns. Uh, when you think about that, you have, you know, basically people that share a lot of information about themselves, which friends you have, uh, when is your kid going to school, when you pick them up, um, all of these interesting shares that you do could be used for doing, let's say, bad things of analyzing you when you're at home and not at home. So this led to some of the um, elements where you definitely have people like here. You see that as an example. That's actually a real life example from my friendships. Um, where basically someone who is absolutely not called me, may you, um, is basically having not the real name inside and not the real picture inside in order to participate in Facebook, but not being directly visible of what is basically behind the different person. And sometimes it's even like these friends create profiles, especially in Germany, I have to say, just to look at others, but don't share anything about themselves, right? So this is, of course, a bit destroying the concept but of course there are lots of privacy and security concerns as well and this is of course something i would like to get you active on thinking about um, that this is of course sort of issue um, of course facebook gets lots of ad revenues out of this and as big companies they're not only interested in that of course they also have other ideas um, other products where basically um, all this information can be used for more specific targeting, um, basically um, in the marketing area. And we are basically there as something uh, we call also individual orientation, uh, individual oriented communication tool, where you basically have um, communication tools in the past where this bulletin board services, this is what we had in the past, but now you have really fast communication. 
via this online social networks. I mean, this is something where, you know, you have directly messages that you can put to this person. Um, it's basically just one glimpse away. It can help a lot today of solving problems, but also can lead to distraction a lot when you kind of basically are overwhelmed with the online social networking, you know, messages because you also have, maybe are in Google, you're in YouTube, you're in LinkedIn, you're in Instagram and all the different services and Facebook. And then of course, suddenly, um, you kind of overwhelmed with all these messages. Hence, you have a productivity decrease, although you are in contact with your best friends all the time over the day. And as I said also earlier, watch out. Some of the companies track your Facebook usage also over the day. So when you go back to companies, maybe limit this a little bit. Otherwise, you maybe go in trouble that you spend too much time on Facebook day by day doing work time. What you do, of course, in your own free time in the evening is not necessarily something which is so important for the company. But of course, can be also, again, something where you basically put out your details. If you're not at home every Wednesday for a certain club and you share this happily on Facebook and some friend of a friend uh, maybe shares this again or, you know, leaks this information or whatever. And suddenly people know that you're every Wednesday, even not at home, which could be an, in some respect a social media uh, inspired risk, right, for people that maybe break in. So what is the key functionality of these? I think for you, mostly using it probably is a bit like um, you would say um, a theoretical view of it, just to get you aware of what it really contains. Mostly people have profile or organizations have profile pages, uh, could be combined profiles of different areas, um, like the university, of course, with different schools, with different events and so on. Um, all of them, in a way, have basically already social graph traversal inherent. So basically, go to the subscribers, um, go to the friends uh, of the friends list of the profiles, view the friends of a friend and things like this. Of course, this can be steered a little bit by the access control settings, but these often have actually changed a lot. So with this, um, you also basically have to review this every now and then. Communication and marketing tools. I mean, this is one of the key things. Really instantly in messaging, you can basically directly um, uh, talk to someone. We already said, oops, sorry for this, um, here marketing, you see a sponsored um, idea of doing basically uh, it, it advertising or a very specific lead targeting advertising, which is, of course, one of the key benefits of this online social networks these days, um, because there are so many users, chances are that you make very good business, especially if you're just online. So shared information, of course, you see it's very poor if someone is just always sharing text, text, text and nothing else. So people usually are not spending much time on this, but photos, videos, everything what you can do there. This is, of course, lively and, of course, alluding to something I will end with today which is, is a basically a new job portfolio that this even enabled with the influencers that you have on YouTube, for instance, the access control is sometimes a bit dubious, especially because it here and there changes over time. So people have default values, think they once configured it, and then the access control keeps changing here and now, and then suddenly they share information that they thought they don't share. So it makes sense to every now and then review your security settings, review your privacy settings, and so on. And this is, of course, more valid than, you know, in one social media network than others, for instance, on Facebook, more than Twitter. Twitter is for very short statements, 300 words, uh, characters, then a little bit of text, a little bit of pictures, and that's it to create the post. While, of course, in Facebook, that's different. Even until gaming these days, where you basically have a kind of interesting Facebook gaming area as well. This could be special APIs, calendars. You know, it's very popular here in Iceland to use see Facebook as event calendar. So you get often invites for events happening basically, uh, which is quite interesting to see and to use for that because you can see how many people are already interested. Um, you can already see who is really thinking of really going. So this gives you, of course, some planning um, certainty if you want. So quite interesting. <clears throat> now, taking one example in these different categories in Twitter, you have a profile page. You see that a little bit here from my own example. And I'm using that to basically share only information about myself, not from someone else. Um, you can basically go directly through um, basically the followers and the, the people you follow um, on the profile page. So that there's no big access control. 
Uh, you can actually send direct messages to people, to followers and to the public. Shared information, of course, you see I can share here information that I was in one of the um, German parliaments um, invited to talk a little bit. So this is quite interesting. You can share important aspects, but not much text, just 300 characters. And you can see a little bit on the timeline um, what you can actually then differentiate in terms of access control. But again, compared to Facebook, this is much more simpler. And here in special APIs, you have different um, photo sharing possibilities, different clients, but also automatic news feeds that you can basically then receive. So a very powerful example. If you look at the architecture, though, of course, it has lots of things to do with databases. So lots of things to do with indexing, searching for data. If you're a user and lots of files that needs to be indexed before you actually store it in the database. And the Twitter API gives rise to basically uh, getting access to this data, which is quite interesting. But think about now what motivates the cloud is that there's really lots of lots of users. You see 313 million monthly active users, unique visit monthly to sites with tweets is 1 billion. So this is something where you have, of course, quite a challenge from terms of uh, big data again. And this is already um, basically put into, let's say, a smaller category or smaller big data because you have this character limit, which helps, of course, to keep everything digestible. And this is one of the ideas you see here um, in, in a couple of years ago where a colleague in, in basically in Spain were basically um, inviting me and then basically getting different you know, up to date information directly where I talked, what I talked about from someone perhaps I don't even know or initiatives I don't know and so on. But people can basically share information about yourself very quickly and basically can then get some momentums with resharing that you know, like, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So very very popular um services these days. You see here social graph traversal is then one of the key themes in this. As already discussed um, before, it's very data intensive. So let's look into this a little bit. You have a social graph here in the Facebook architecture where you would have the profiles, text, relationships, and then lots of different APIs that actually then um, enable the different applications that you have there. Facebook there has basically created its own markup language for this. So um, this is quite a very specific theme then for basically the Facebook idea of doing basically a very performant page of an online social network architecture. And of course, a social network in the end is again um, with a social graph that is loaded here. Now, one of the key themes basically, and you want to traverse this graph to retrieve information in, in basically in an efficient way. And you have to be ready for this. And what they did in Facebook is to have a very specific um, associations and objects um, database called Tau, which then essentially represent this graph that we've seen before from the social media perspective in all these different areas here, uh, which is a bit more blank view on all these different interactions and so forth. So it is thousands of different data types, as you can imagine, from pictures, videos to organizations, events. Um, it's basically lots of reads and not so many writes. So I think that's still writes, but the build, usually the read is overwhelming much. And this basically makes it also a bit more performant, or that's why it works, because the writings in a way are not that often. Still, they occur every second for the cloud provider. So hence, there is basically a kind of plethora of different databases needed in order to make this um, working. And as I said earlier, basically the Facebook database is, if you log in all the data sets, really a smart combination of MySQL, SQL databases, the graph database tau that I mentioned here, you have different NoSQL key value stores um, that like HBase already presented earlier um, that basically then give rise to the whole Facebook experience for different purposes. If you click on a friend of a friend, it's different than searching in the whole Facebook, for instance, for a specific name, right? So these are all different questions for basically you have different um, databases that then bring the experience together. Still, the graph database is a very important factor and basically accumulating data in a very inhomogeneous way um, where we basically then have very large scale graphs where we have millions or hundreds of millions of user nodes and that needs to be basically um, high performant and you can put them in smaller graphs basically in order to make a high performance. 
Here you see an example of the database tau. Um, again, when you think about what I discussed before, relationships between the different um, uh, you know, actors, locations, uh, the, the things you perform like a check-in. I think this is something what I already was basically showing you before. So I think this is also used uh, by many people. And then you have, of course, different tool sets you can use, for instance, the Apache GraphX database um, that we also have, let's say, looked into when we looked a little bit on the kind of uh, web page or page rank idea. If you remember, this was another idea of a web graph. Now it's online social networking is another type of a graph view where you basically can use specific APIs that are really optimized for working with graphs. And it has basically lots of iterative graph computations for traversing a, a graph. And this is, of course, something which is then scalable, as you remember from Spark, it can also scale up, scale down with the graph itself and with this perfect for cloud environments. Um, we have used this um, Spark clusters before. And of course, instead of using now the machine learning library that you already know from earlier lectures, you just simply use a GraphX library. Still, the overall idea of the deployment of the different worker nodes and cluster managers will remain the same. Hence, um, there are different services in the cloud that are based on this. The one example is the Elastic MapReduce you already know with Spark. Of course, the same idea as we discussed before, but instead of machine learning library, you just use the GraphX library and can then basically start with having really powerful graph representations. So a very powerful tool um, where it is used. Another idea of going to another cloud if you don't want to use, let's say, the Spark way of doing it, you have the Amazon Neptune graph databases, and on, it's basically also used by Netflix, which is quite nice. It has, um, you know, an easy to build interface uh, to really have applications um, which are really highly density connected. Um, this is basically two types of different graphs you would basically um, um, basically need usually as a company. One is a knowledge graph that really store information in all the graph model and you can basically have an easy navigation between these different connected data sets so that's a real life experience and on the other hand you have an identity graph that can be basically uh, good for basically uh, looking at all the different information that you put on the different identities itself so hence basically you have the same graph but different views or different let's say subgraphs you essentially create out of this um, uh, whether it's this knowledge graph that you see a little bit here, again, with having an emphasis on all these different nodes here, and then the identity graph where you basically have then um, an, an interesting um, identity of these different connections. So it's a little bit a similar uh, approach with the graph, but still different in nature when you think about what you want to understand uh, basically with this graph. And that's why it's definitely used in Amazon. Um, but of course, it's just one service, which makes it, of course, quite transparent. So in a way, this knowledge, as the name suggests, is really something where you have all the information structured according to some information. And you want to about a certain people or um, let's say a certain location. And you want to extract this information very quickly for easy access and understand then this kind of object better. While the identity um, graph then basically can be really used for advertising, used basically in real life, um, um, you know, walk through through the graph when you basically sweep through the information, but then put in advertising um, and different parts. And these are elements where alone on Neptune, you can have a whole uh, university lecture. And we don't have time for this. So I go here a little bit quicker. And we'll just we'll talk to you a little bit about advertising, where you basically have in Facebook, of course, also a nice API to really nail down, especially the location you want to basically target your marketing on, which is quite um, popular and very easy to do just with a couple of clicks and a couple of, you know, credit card swipes. That's where you have to pay suddenly, right? So, of course, for advertising, you have to pay. Um, this is a very interesting, you know, business model and, of course, return of investment for advertising for Facebook. But, you know, the same is done also in Google. As you know, if you use a Google search engine, the first couple of entries usually are quite some um, keywords that basically match some certain advertising or sponsored and so on. You see that here with the ad, right, in all these different search strings. 
The interesting thing though, you can use this information if you use a key planner tool to understand what people are really searching for and then can maybe optimize your website, can optimize your um, your YouTube lectures. There's the same story um, for what people are really searching for. And it's a really um, interesting business today called search engine optimization ex uh, experts like SEO and so on. So it has reached quite some stability <clears throat> and of course, we see it everywhere, right? So when you have a website, there's a Google ad coming in. And if you click on it, there's some revenues for those that basically then um, put it on their website to have the spaces, let's say, given to ads. And the website owner earns and of course, also for the, the, the one that actually is putting the ad is usually just put into the context of websites where it really matters to. So it's a win-win scenario, both win, basically. And there's something what you can do with AdSense. If you have basically just a small script you insert into your website, you have no idea what exact maybe, um, you know, marketing will appear, but you can be sure if you configure it right that it will be related to something like big data. For instance, you see big data here and we get an advertising on Spark, Hadoop and so on. So it fits at the same as in YouTube a little bit. If you have premium, of course, which is another business model. If you premium in YouTube, you don't see these anymore, but then of course you have to pay nine uh, dollar or nine um, euros per month or something like this. So there's the other business model, of course, to get rid of the ads that you already know from several different, um, you know, kind of apps that you have on your mobile devices. So this is a huge story again. And here, who workshops just based on this idea of this. So I skip again to the next topic where you think um, that you'll see a little bit of what and who is using essentially in which application domains this. So the statistics of these kind of online social networks are quite interesting. Um, you see here a little bit of active users, 1.65 billion, right? Compared to Twitter, just the 320 million. That's very different. Or you basically see the information that you can basically put there in LinkedIn, which is another one, which is quite nice because here, um, you see it has directly an impact to the job market. It's quite professional. You can mark yourself as open to work. It's a complete different setup than maybe Facebook. Here it's really oriented towards jobs, professions. You can endorse someone for specific, um, let's say, uh, yeah, parts of their, uh, their specific competencies. And then ResearchGate is very special, of course, for us researchers, where you have also then uh, the idea of sharing research, you know how much is cited and so on. And all of that is basically application areas that you would have in online social networking. And hence, it's a big topic you can imagine that I cannot cover completely, but I hope you got a little bit the feeling how basically clouds are helping there a lot in order to really make it as a user experience that we like. Interesting enough, it has actually coined a different job profile that many of you know these days called influencers. And this video will talk a little bit about what an influencer is doing. A Rippling's campaign. Valentine's Day is a date marked by love and by brand managers alike, being a special day that resonates with India's youth. But Instead of focusing on romantic love, Pringle as a brand read their audience and declared being single is cool if you're single as a Pringle. Pringles is all you need and a campaign was executed with Facebook and Twitter influencers. Viral Facebook pages and hashtag single as a Pringle trended on Twitter. Then overnight, a wink changed the world and India went crazy for Priya Varier. Through quick adaptive thinking, the campaign put Priya Varia front and center and created the next chapter in her story that she was as single as a Pringle. A collaboration with Priya Varia fit perfectly into the brand's tongue-in-cheek campaign, winning over millions on Valentine's Day. The value of the collaboration with Priya Varia increased in real time. As on the day of the campaign, her follower count grew 500k. The collaboration was able to capitalize upon the nation's sentiments, making the campaign instantly newsworthy. And the results were phenomenal. In just two days, the campaign garnered a reach of 7.5 million and 40,000 plus conversations.
the viral Instagram post received an awesome response with 1.4 million likes and 30,000 plus comments. The campaign was well received digitally and got organic PR coverage in over 15 publishers. It was appreciated by digital gurus across the web. And to think, it all started with a wink. Right, needless to say, I'm not paid by Pringles, as you probably all know already. But it's an interesting story. If it tells the influencers also, you think about the hotels these days, there are lots of people putting on YouTube very nice videos on drone pictures from interesting exotic locations, from videos about hotels, about a very nice location, and just basically just making money with videos every day because people are looking in it and getting here and there even influencer status. Um, and that's a quite interesting job creation that this clouds and this kind of ad business really did over the years. So that's all I had on the table here for you in terms of online social networking, advertising and graph databases and so forth. The next topic will be streaming. And basically, we start with this after a short break. <laughs> 